Uh, welcome to the Mike Hewitt Show. My name is Mike Hewitt, and my guest today is Michael Hill. Uh, Michael Hill is the president of an organization uh, that's called the, the League of the South. Um, um, Michael Hill, welcome to the Mike Hewitt Show. Mike, thanks for having me on today. I really appreciate it. Hey, I'm, I'm excited to have you on because I, I have to tell you, I saw, just, just so you know where I picked up on you, as I, I look at Drudge, the Drudge Report periodically, and I saw on the Drudge Report where you folks down there had had a big billboard sign that evidently popular demand or political correctness or whatever caused the sign company to uh, to remove the sign. And listen, I'm a, just so you know where I'm coming from, Michael. I'm a, a free speech guy. I'm I, there's a lot of folks that say things I don't agree with, and I'll fight for their right to say them. Um, I write. I, obviously, I, I you, you can tell right away I like free speech because here I'm on, on the radio and TV. So when I saw that they, they stripped you, this is my perception, you can correct me, but it felt like they stripped your entire membership of your right to say whatever it was you felt felt a, a need to say. So what I'm hoping to do is have you tell me a little bit about the background of of your what your billboard said and why they wanted it out and where you're at with it now. And then, frankly, after that, I want to get into the concept of the League of the South and what you folks are calling for. So t- start me off. We're, what's going on with the billboards? Well, uh, the billboard uh, said one word besides having our name, League of the South, and our web address on it. It said CC. Now, a little background. The, the League of the South is a 20-year-old Southern Nationalist organization, and what we want is a free and independent South, and we certainly are willing to grant that right to the other states and regions of the country. Uh, in other words, we like just like to dump D.C. and rule ourselves. Uh, so that that's a little background. But our, our sign was a, a billboard on the Interstate 85 in Montgomery, Alabama, the capital of the state of Alabama, we had the same billboard up in Tallahassee, Florida, which is the capital of Florida. Uh, in fact, right in front of the uh, state capitol building for two months with no problems. I mean, there was some controversy over it, sure, but the, the sign company, Lamar Advertising, uh, you know, they, they didn't try to take it down or anything. Uh, so we had a great experience with the same exact same billboard in Tallahassee. Uh, they moved the billboard vinyl for us from Tallahassee to Montgomery, and it was supposed to have gone up this past Monday, but actually they put it up the previous Friday, which was a few days early. Um, you know, we went down and got some photographs of it. Uh, the local uh, uh, Birmingham newspapers here, the biggest newspapers in the state, did a pretty good story on it. And, you know, we were getting uh, our money's worth. You know, we were, uh, you know, getting people to discuss the issue, uh, getting publicity off of it, which was our, our goal anyway. And lo and behold, on Saturday afternoon, I opened my email, and there's an email from our Lamar Advertising rep in Montgomery saying, uh, sorry, but we've had some complaints. And we've also had some people who have threatened to, to withdraw their business from us. So we're taking your sign down. So that was Saturday afternoon, and by 10 o'clock on Sunday morning, I had one of our guys ride by there, and the sign indeed was gone. Now, we did a little subsequent research that Sunday afternoon and drove around all over Montgomery and found out that about 90% of the interstate billboard signs were owned by Lamar Advertising. So their their claim that they were going to be economically uh, hurt by this simply didn't hold water. Because if all those people are going to be withdrawing their support, withdrawing their business, rather, from Lamar, who are they going to go to? They're, they have a monopoly on billboard signs on the interstate in Montgomery. So we thought that they were lying about that. And I- that left only one reason, Mike politics. Somebody threatened them politically. Right. Uh, and, and they removed our message. And I called it squelching dissent, like, you know, they might do in Stalin's Russia or something like that. <laughs> I got to tell you, I, it certainly it is about politics. But one, one of the things in our in our in the world we're in is, as you're more than aware, probably than anybody else. But if you if you fly the Confederate battle flag, you're going to be painted as, as a racist no matter what your position on race is. 
And and I did a little bit of research on that topic with your organization before I invited you on the show um, to be to be candid with you because I, I didn't want to put myself in that kind of position. But what I found was a couple things, and you can tell me if I'm misquoting. You know a fellow named Don Kennedy? Oh, yes. He's a longtime friend of mine. Yeah, Don Kennedy was asked whether you folks were a racist organization, and he his quote was, how can you believe in liberty and discriminate against your neighbor? Um, and I got to tell you, as I'm a Jeffersonian, if you look for my own political background, and, and with that, I, I think that we, if we all embrace equality, we'll actually get it. Until we all equally embrace it, we're not going to get it, and it's just that simple. But then I looked at you, the position that the LC offered. The LC disavows a spirit of malice and extends an offer of goodwill and cooperation to Southern blacks in areas where it. it what I liked about this, frankly, is that it's there were twofold, well, threefold even. First off, if you read any of the founding fathers of the United States of America, um, there's not any of them that would have signed on to the Constitution as it was written without the right to secede. And so take that as the backdrop to my comments and the reason I've got you on the show. The, the, the next thing that I find fascinating is that there are a lot of areas within the United States that are on... There's some there's some states in the South that are wanting to secede from each other, meaning divide. California, the northern group, wants to leave the southern group. Michigan has got an upper peninsula that's about every 10 years goes on a crusade to secede from the state. Uh, this is not a concept that's tied to a racial issue that in the South period. And, and I, so I think it's really, really important for us to have a public dialogue about the word secede. And that's kind of what attracted me to you. Well, you know, there are some voices down here among the left, and, and believe it or not, even in a very conservative place like Alabama, you have a, a, a number of enclaves of leftism, really hard leftism, and they, they equate the uh, term secession or secede with racism. Right. And that, that is just absolutely insane. Uh, it, no, it's, it's, it's an automatic, but I have to tell you that. One of the things I learned writing my first novel was uh, an old adage that says, to the winner goes the propaganda. And yeah. so not to get into the North and the South battle, I'm calling you from Michigan, by the way, but not to get into that battle. But obviously that, what if you, if you, if you talk to the folks that, that want to debate it, it's always about slavery until sure. you actually read the letters of secession. And, sure. and then, of course, then it paints it a little bit different thing. But I think what sure. we're actually talking about here is none of that historical stuff, but no, actually a term no. called political correctness. Absolutely. And let me let me just interject here. I'm reading from Wikipedia. Uh, it says political correctness, and then it says historically the term was a colloquialism. I never can say that word right. Used in the early to mid 20th century by communists and socialists in political debates, uh, referring projectively to the Communist Party line, which provided the correct positions for uh, positions on on many matters of politics. And, and that's literally where the term came from. Now, it's been adopted by the new left as they're identified. Uh, but the new left, I got to tell you, is the same as the old left. Probably worse. Yeah, maybe, maybe. But I can tell you that this, when I, when I hear someone that says, you've got to take your billboard down because they don't like it, or they want to burn my book because they don't like it, um, I think, wait a minute, don't look at the sign. Don't read my book. It's just that simple. I don't. The concept that I, I'm so intimidated by your verbiage, I've got to find a way to shut you up. That's about as un-American as you can get, in my view. Well, you know, I, I don't begrudge a business, uh, you know, making decisions uh, in the interest of its own bottom line. But again, as I as I explained before, we don't think this is really an economic issue with the advertising company. We think that they were politically pressured. And it, we have some people uh, exploring into this to find out what really happened. And I, I'm, I'm sure that's what we're going to find. But if it's truly and exclusively a political issue, then it, you're right. It absolutely is shameful and un-American. And let me interject something else. You, you said something about, uh, you know, North versus South. Uh, that's not what this struggle is today. You know, a lot of people, when you... Uh, combine the term Southern and and secession or secede, they <laughs> automatically think you're wanting to refight the war between the states. Right. That's history. That's gone. That's 150 years ago. 
we're we're living in a completely different age today, and there are people in North and South both who think right about these issues. And I, I said we've got a lot of Southerners down here that are, are bigger enemies to the League of the South than, than good righteous Northerners are. Right. Yep. I I, I couldn't uh, couldn't agree with you more. Um, I I think that you know a lot of people. In fact, if you it's a fascinating thing I've talked about it on this show before. If you Google the Second Civil War, um, I've literally put it because I'm writing a novel, so I'm doing research on that stuff. So I Google literally put a quote the Second Civil War in quote, and and the responses that you'll get from Google are about two thirds left and one third right wing. And uh-huh. <laughs> what surprised the heck out of me, frankly, I really did. Everyone automatically thinks maybe the opposite because peace, love, dove is left. And the truth of it is, is that the very left, and I'm not talking about your average Democrat walking down the street. The sure. very left is very militant. And they're the very folks. Violent. Yeah, they are. They're exactly. They're the folks that demand that I shut my mouth and that you pull your sign down. And that's not the average person. The average person, they don't like it. They don't listen to it and they move on. Well, you're absolutely right about that, Mike. Uh, there was a there was a very very leftist blog that uh, did a story about this issue of our billboard, and uh, of course it was it was slanted very much against us. But the interesting thing uh, was going on and reading all the comments from all the extreme left wingers that came on there. I mean, they're, they're talking about bombing the South back into the Stone Age, right? You know, that's what they want to see. They want to come down here. They said it's too bad Sherman didn't finish the job first and, you know, kill all your uh, descendants, So, I mean, your uh, ancestors, so you wouldn't be here today. You know, just really, really awful stuff like that. Yeah, very, very volatile. But listen, even even on Facebook, where I, where I do a lot of political talk on Facebook— if and, and frankly, I use it as a, res, a little bit to a degree as a research for the book I'm writing. But if I put up, well, like an article about your post uh, or your your situation with Secede, I get a lot of comments back that are automatically about the the South and the North. So, you know, it's illegal to secede, uh, and that that debate has already been prosecuted with both a war and the Supreme Court decision in 1869. And so people automatically dismiss it. But the truth of it is is that there's a lot of people that are feeling very, very anxious about what's going on in our in our country in total. And that's why you've got places like the UP and Michigan looking to secede, or so many people having conversations, writing books, and actually doing many series on TV. You've got the one revolution that's hard left, by the way. And last night I watched the final episode, and it ended with a UN commercial. Talk about sending a shiver down my back. <laughs> I went, holy moly, there's something that the North and the South better get together and agree on. We- yeah. Really? <laughs> that's something else. Yeah, that's uh, true. So, so tell me, what, what, is the, what is the goal of the League of the South? What, do you folks have a, a, a driving agenda, maybe some sub-agendas? What, how does it work? And Tell me about well, it a little bit. Okay. Uh, well, we've been a Southern Nationalist organization our whole life, from 1994 to 2014, 20 years, we want to see a free and independent South. And when I say free and independent, I mean independent from D.C. Uh, D.C. is nothing but a drag. It's like having a millstone around your neck. Uh, and as I said at the, at the very beginning, you know, we recognize that, that other historic regions of North America deserve the same thing that we would like to see for ourselves. That is independence from D.C. Uh, you know, we have nothing against our uh, brothers and sisters uh, who are, are right-thinking in other parts of the country. But we would really like to rule ourselves independent from D.C. And what uh, shape that will take, I don't know. But we're big believers in state sovereignty, and we believe that the people of the, the citizens, rather, of the separate states ought to be able to decide these things for themselves. So we're, we're a southern nationalist organization, but, you know, and the sub-agenda, as you mentioned, which is very important right now, one of the things we're trying to do is to protect ourselves and our culture from just simply being uh, overrun and, and banished by political correctness and illegal immigration and all the things that a- actually threaten to undo the very land in which we live here. So, uh, yeah, we have some sub-agendas, but the long-term objective, Mike, is a free and independent South and what form that will take, whether it'll be, you know, uh, uh, 
two or three different countries or a whole bunch of separate states or one new southern republic. I don't know, but that's our goal. When when we when we after after we take a break, I want to get into some of the national politics that you just touched on. But tell me sure. before we get there, how many? I see you've got state chapters. Is that right? Oh uh, yes, we do, Mike. Uh, how many states? How many states do you have chapters in? Uh, we have at, at present probably about twenty. Uh, now, at one time we had twenty five or twenty six. Wait but, a minute, that can't be possible, Michael. That's more than the states have <laughs> seceded. Uh, uh, no, that's, that's what I was hoping you'd say. Yeah, we actually we actually have, have a Midwest chapter. Uh, quite quite a few members in the Midwest. So we have a California chapter, a New York chapter. Arizona, New Mexico, uh, Northwestern uh, chapter, Montana, Idaho, uh, Washington, Oregon. Uh, but mainly it's in the south, mainly from Virginia, Maryland and Virginia down to Texas. Sounds like a lot of people read, read, read up and understand the, the circumstance we're in. Um, yes. Tell me this, how many, how many members would you guess that are, are either active or at some point, um, you know, show, showing some some commonality with your organization. I'm just well, trying to get a know, feel for the actual sure. volume of it. Sure, I, I understand. And you've, you've got uh, I, a way I always like to do is break this down because I don't want the left to ever get a real hold uh, uh, on how strong we are. You just say a whole but bunch? I, I, <laughs> yeah, I will say this, that uh, we have uh, a cadre of very, very active members. I mean, really, really active members. Then we have an a circle outside that of members who are less active but mainly support us, uh, you know, online and by writing letters and uh, by making financial contributions. And then outside of that circle, a much larger group are not members, but they're supporters. And these people, make, you know, I talked to one yesterday, Mike. He said, I can't afford to join you because if the left-wing press ever got when that I was a, a member of your group, I, it would destroy my business. And we have a lot of uh, active duty military personnel and law enforcement officers who are members of the league, or excuse me, are supporters of the league. But at this point, they don't, they can't risk being members. Right. So you know, we've got basically three levels: an inner core, an outer circle of members, and then a huge outer circle of supporters. And the supporters probably provide more of our resources for us than the members actually do. But the, the, that central core, I can give you a ba basic number on that. That central core is between uh, is about seven thousand people. Okay, that's a fair that's a fair fair bunch of people. Listen, we're gonna we're gonna go to a break, Michael. But when we okay. come back. I want to talk to you a little bit about some other examples in the world. I'll start with Crimea. <laughs> and okay. We'll good. talk about some world secession, and we'll be right back, folks. Okay. That's good. Hi, if you ever find yourself arrested in jail and got bail, make sure you call me, Tommy D, at Bad Boys Bail Bonds, 866-728-728. 6400 because if I can't get you out, you ain't getting out. Hey, have you ever thought about becoming a fugitive recovery agent and you're not certified, don't know where to turn, don't know what to do or what to expect? Log on to National Academy of Bail Enforcement.com and apply today. Classes are forming soon in Michigan. Tell them Tommy D sent you. I've made a discovery. The down home community our grandparents loved is still here. Seriously, that's what you'll find at Renegade River in downtown Spring Lake. You might be looking for a new or used hunting rifle or something for personal defense. Maybe a DNR sport license or fishing supplies. Personal and home defense. Hunting, Army, Navy supplies, fishing, survival gear, and even a tools and guy stuff consignment department. You'll be greeted by low prices and quick professional service provided by shopkeeper Mike Hewitt. If you're not in a hurry, grab a cup of coffee and join in the conversation. Renegade River, firearms, hunting, personal protection and survival gear, going camping or looking for emergency products. Come take advantage of the prices while meeting up with old friends and making new ones. Renegade River, next to the police station in downtown Spring Lake. Or go to the website, renegaderiver.com. 
Attention hip replacement patients. Several metal-on-metal -metal hip implants have been recalled, and a jury recently awarded $8.3 million to one hip replacement victim. Metal-on-metal -metal hip implants can cause excruciating pain and may require expensive surgery to replace. If you had a metal-on-metal -metal hip replacement and it's been removed or it needs to be removed, call the Goldwater Law Firm right now. I'm attorney Bob Goldwater. Metal-on-metal -metal hip replacements can be dangerous. If you have a metal-on-metal -metal hip implant, even if it hasn't failed yet, call us right now. You may be entitled to substantial compensation. The manufacturer of your defective hip implant should have to pay for your medical expenses and your pain and suffering. Your time to act is quickly running out, so call us right now. If you have a metal-on-metal -metal hip replacement and it's been removed or is causing you problems, call 1-800-540-9516. That's 1-800-540-9516. Uh, welcome back to the Mike Hewitt Show. My guest today is Michael Hill, who is the president of an organization titled or called the League of the South. Michael, welcome back. Uh, thank you, Mike. Thanks listen, for having me. Yeah, I'm, I'm, listen, I'm enjoying our conversation, and I, and I wanted to share with you a couple different times in the past. I've had a lady on the show that was born and raised in the Soviet era, uh, Russia, and, you know... <laughs> I want to talk about, if I can, a little bit of what I learned from her the last time I had her on. I, I invited her on the show the last time to talk about the uh, the, the push of Russia to uh, annex uh, Crimea at the time, and and also the eastern side, the southeastern side of uh, Ukraine in total. And uh, of course, my my perspective going in to that conversation was what I see in the media. And when I got done talking to her, I had a very different perspective. Um, you know, it was kind of her point. I'm not wanting to put words in her mouth, but it was her point that she didn't. She felt that Putin was not the aggressor; that the European Union, a socialist organization, was the aggressor, and that if Crimea is primarily made up of Russians, Russian-speaking people that identify themselves as Russian citizens and vote to be with Russia, what business is it of ours to? interject in that. Um, and I got to tell you, after having talked to, talked to her a couple different times now, I've come to see that quite a bit. And then it causes me to say, what if, with that as a backdrop, and I see what our reaction has been, well, actually, in this case, none. Uh, but how, do you see that the same? How do you see that? What was your take on Crimea's takeover? Pretty much the same as you just described. Uh you know, the, the EU uh, is, is a very socialist organization. Unfortunately, in this case, the United States is, is, is backing the EU. And I don't, I don't know if you saw this the other day, but uh, Joe Biden's son has been appointed as the, I think, legal director of a big uh, uh, gas company in Ukraine now that they've, uh, uh, you know, got their, their cronies in, in power in Kiev. Uh, you know the the favors are flowing uh, to the uh, uh, <laughs> politicians over here. So, yeah, I, I think you're you're right, Mike, and I think I think your guess was right. Uh, Vladimir, excuse me, Vladimir Putin and the Russians are not the aggressors here. It's the EU and the United States, and they are uh, you know pushing the agenda. And, and you know I, the suspicious person that I am. I think this probably has something to do with taking over the natural resources for the banks, right. uh, Western banks. But uh, Russia is not the aggressor here, and I certainly agree that the Russian-speaking and culturally Russian uh, people of the Ukraine have every right to make a decision about their their future. I believe in self-determination like that. I, I really do. You know, some of the things I learned from her, and then we'll get back on topic, but just one last point about what I learned from her that I didn't know because the media doesn't doesn't educate us, I guess, and not that I should default my education to the media, but, you know, the capital of Ukraine was where Russia was founded. And so we're not talking about some far-flung, you know, land somewhere that they're just snatching up. I mean, th those people largely, especially when I got into looking at uh, some of the political maps that, frankly, were colored the same way we do presidential maps here that showed elections. And, and the area that she was identifying as people that perceived themselves as Russian were, were voted consistently election after election and, uh, in a different pattern than the rest of Ukraine. 
and it got yeah. to the point where it left me asking the obvious question. I mean, we know in America what the history was when the South decided to secede. We know what the Supreme Court ruling was in 1869. But and let me just pick on Florida for a minute. What if, because Florida is a nice peninsula. What if Florida decided on its own with a vote of its legislature uh, and its people to secede from the United States? And then it took an action to actually legally do that. And then the question becomes, would the United States military go in there and say, no, you're not going to do that? What is your opinion? Uh, yeah, that's the question. I mean, that is the $64,000 question, as the old saying goes, Mike. I would like to think that they would have the good sense in this day and age of extremely destructive weaponry in the hands of both sides, by the way, that they would uh, they would think twice about initiating a uh, military conflict to stop somebody from self determination. Uh, if the people of Florida decide through their legislature or through some other uh, uh, representative body that they want to leave and become a sovereign nation of their own, uh, I mean, why why go to war to stop that? That that would be absolutely insane with the weaponry that we have today. I, 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 th I think you're right, but I think history, both contemporary, current, recent history, and in the history of our own country, demonstrates that they would physically stop that secession. Uh, and in fact, I'm probably going to get a lot of Facebook messages that say, of course they would, Mike. What would you expect? We can't just let a group of people go off on their own. I, I guarantee you I'm going to get some of those messages. Um, oh, and and un would. unfortunately, people are going to reduce this issue to race, and it's got absolutely nothing to do with race. Oh, it certainly doesn't. It has to do with basically with local self-government and freedom. Uh, but, yeah, I, th I think you're right. I'm saying that, you know, it would be uh, a, a travesty and a tragedy both uh, for there to be military force used to stop uh, Florida or any other state from doing this if that's what its citizens wished. But I, I think you're right. I think they, the powers that be in D.C. would do that. At, least, at the very least, they would use intimidation. Right. Uh, and probably selective violence against the leaders. It, it seems, Michael, that there's a push in the opposite direction. It doesn't seem, and it's a matter of fact. That, and what I'm getting at is that, let me use, use North America as an example with CAFTA and, and uh, NAFTA, uh, and then the European Union, as we've already kind of touched on, and, and the Russians. There's a push globally to create larger blocks of central government, not smaller blocks. Um, and, you know, when I was writing my book, America's Final Beginning, the, the foe in the book, if you will, was the Global Socialist Authority. But when I, about halfway through the book, it dawned on me that with our, our two million armed, armed personnel and civilian personnel stretched over a thousand bases on the sovereign soil of 150 nations, I went, wait a minute, we're the Global Socialist Authority. Really? It, it's a little bit scary when you start looking at just the numbers and set all of your your personal, you know, feelings aside and look at just the math, the math is kind of daunting. Um, it really is. But my point, my point in getting into that part a little bit is that there's a, I don't know who the powers to be are, so I'm not trying to point in any one direction or another, but the powers to be, whoever they are, seem hell-bent on pushing larger groups of, of geographic areas under one control, uh, whether it's all of North America, all of South America, all of Europe, um, you know, in, in in what I believe to be an, a, an end push towards a, a global government. Now, I, I don't want to sound like a radical when I say that, but when I put the math together and set ideology ideology aside for a moment, that appears to be the direction. What do you think? Well, Mike, I gave I gave a speech somewhere around the year two thousand, right at the turn of this century, uh, and and in that speech, the, the 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 gist of the speech was that the great battle, the the big battle of the 21st century would be between localists and nationalists versus universalists and internationalists. And there would be this push and pull. The, the, the nationalists and localists would be pulling for secession, you know, to, to make uh, things smaller and more local and more free and more determined by the local population while the globalist and universalist or internationalist would be pulling to, as you pointed out, make everything come under one centralized control 
And sure enough, I think that that is going to be the defining political issue globally of this century. Right. And it's going to have to be fought out, and it's going to have to be won, and it may be a bloody conflict. Hey, Michael, you you, uh, you, you ever go bowling? Oh, I love to bowl, Well, yeah. the, re- the reason I'm asking you, and you're going to laugh at me, but you ever see when you take kids bowling and they got those uh, uh, the bumper guards uh, that, you know, the, so that they can't throw a gutter ball? Uh-huh, right. Okay, so the big long rubber hoses or whatever they are that lie right, in either yeah. gutter. And and where I'm going with this is that there's a there's a handful of catch all words that political correctness has established to guard against what you and I are talking about. And an example is when you say the word nationalist, the left automatically paints you as a Hitler. You're aware of, of that. Okay. Of so but when I think of when I think of globalism, by the way, because I'm a little bit more well read when it comes at least to this topic, I think of Trotskyism. Okay. Sure. And uh, you know Trotskyism for those not familiar with the word is you know he was a uh, uh, Trotsky was a the, the partner if you will in the uh, uh in the um the revolution that was was became the Soviet Union and Trotsky wanted to have that communism all over the world whereas whereas his partners they they just wanted to dominate um you know the the Soviet uh, area uh regions of Europe. And so when I when I look at uh, just that when I look at the globalists I think of Trotsky's because they are they're very far left they're not just left they're not saying hey I'm a plumber and so I I belong to the plumbers union therefore I'm a Democrat it's not that simple they're they're way left of those folks but they're the ones with their hands on the on a lot of the levers including the words that we use yeah that's right uh, Trotsky was an international communist uh, Lenin to a lesser degree and particularly Stalin were uh, Russian nationalists, and they were communists. So, you know, to say that uh, nationalism is always equated with some uh, some right-wing uh, radical uh, ideology is false, because Stalin, in particular, was a Russian nationalist as much as he was a communist. I, I, think, the way that, I think the way the train of thought goes is that if you're a fella or a lady wanting to defend your way of life, then that must mean, when they convert it in their head, that must mean automatically that you're trying to extinguish somebody else's way of life. And, yeah, the, and the, ir- right. the irony to that thinking is that we're the same people that are going, no, no, no. If you don't like the words we're saying, don't listen. But we would never try to shut you up. Yeah, yeah that's right. I tell people, people say, well, uh, you know, most of the people in the League of the South are white, aren't they? I said, well, yeah, that's just the way it goes. That's just the people who have joined us well. Uh, that's not right. Well, why not? You know, I, we don't hate anybody else. We simply, uh, we, I, I, I love my family. I love my cousins <laughs> and my friends and, and all the, and they just happen to be white. So when you said you uh, love your cousins, you must have one you don't like. Cause I heard you laugh a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I do have some that, it, that think that I'm crazy. <laughs> <laughs> Imagine that. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, really. But no, the, the thing is that you know what the left always thinks that well, you know, particularly if you're a white person and you love your own people, that somehow that automatically makes you a racist. Yeah, but well, I yeah. but I, I got to tell you on that point, Michael. I've got um, I don't know forty nine hundred and fifty or so people on my Facebook page that are friends. Most of them are political minded. I don't know them, so I know them through Facebook. Are they friends? I, I always like the word that Facebook uses. But sure. it's the people within my political sphere, if you will. They're stretched across the United States. They're not just in West Michigan. They're all over the South. There's probably probably people in your community that are either one or two or three people removed from my little circle of Facebook friends. And, and I have to tell you, most of the people on that little circle identify themselves as patriots. And mm-hmm. among those patriots, there's a significant number of black patriots and of Hispanic patriots and of American Indian patriots and about every other, and you start going, wait a minute, um, this isn't white or black or anything else. This is just a <laughs> bunch of Americans that want liberty. Yeah, I, I think I think that uh, a lot of the uh, so-called minorities are beginning to realize that uh, you know people like Obama and Eric Holder and uh, well, some of the La Raza. What, you leaders don't... and all are really not their friends. Wait a minute, you mean you don't like Obama? Well, <laughs> <laughs> not really. <laughs> not so much. In the interest, in the interest of full disclosure, 
No, not really. <laughs> but, you know, I, I, I bring up the, the race thing because, you know, every time a white Southerner like me tries to do anything, that's the first thing that the left does is yeah. look at look at us and say, oh, you're white right. and you're a Southerner. That must mean that you're a, a dreaded racist. So, you know, they, they try to put us on the defensive right. from the very beginning. And I just tell them, look. You know, I just love my own people. You know, I, God's just put that love for my family and my people in my heart. And I don't wish anybody else any ill, I, I but bet, I do love my people. I bet you the NSA is is, is watching everything you do. Uh, well, I'd be <laughs> hey, Mike, I'd be disappointed if they weren't. Well, you're, you're a leader of, doing my well, job. The leader of a secession movement. You know they're watching you. That's almost <laughs> that's as, fine. That's almost that's as fine. bad if as— they weren't, I wouldn't— I wouldn't be doing my job right if they weren't. Yeah, that's almost as bad as being a talk show host, a book writer, and a gun shop owner, okay? Oh, man, a gun shop, a gun shop owner. That really puts yeah. you in bad yeah. company. <laughs> I get kind of a kick out of it because all of these things are, are just so cliche, and they have absolutely nothing to do with who the people are we're talking about. And, yeah. and you think, wow, they're controlling a lot of people with some really shallow um, um, little caricatures that they've drawn sure. that have nothing right, to do with you know, reality. That's what I always tell people. I said, look, don't play by their rules. Right. Don't play by their rules. If you play by their rules, then they will win every time. You have got to get outside of the box and play by set your own rules, and that confounds and confuses them when they cannot throw words at you like, racist, homophobe, xenophobe, all the things that they do to make make the right wing cower in fear of being called some names. If you just look at them and say, look, that's not true. I, I'm, I, that's, I'm not that, so I'm not going to buy into your description of me. I know what I am, I know what I believe, and it's just fine. So uh, <laughs> if we can do that, we can defeat them. Now, tell me tell me some specifics. What, what about the United States of America wants you on a get away from the central government and, and have your, your areas be on their own? Are there some well, specific complaints you've got with the government? Well, one is that, you know, the, the, the whole regime, is, and I call it a regime because I think that's, that's the negative uh, term that, that fits it. You know, it's not only physically and financially bankrupt uh, and dragging everybody else down with it, but it's also morally bankrupt. I mean, it's a godless, I mean, I'm a Christian, it's a godless entity. And I just don't think that Christians need to be, uh, you know, putting their allegiance uh, with something like that. I, I think that it's, uh, it's getting worse by the year. It's a moral cesspool in D.C. Uh, there's corruption galore. Uh, it's not representative government, Mike. They ignore the Constitution. They ignore the consent of the governed, and they ignore the fundamental notion that our rights and liberties don't come from government. They come from God, and government is supposed to be here to protect them, uh, to not 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 to uh, not to abuse them, and certainly not to take them away from us. So we do, and, and you know, on top of this, all Mike, I just think we can govern ourselves better regionally than we can having one size fits all sitting there on the Potomac, uh, dictating to everybody what they must do down to the smallest, minute details. Uh, I, I, you, you and I are are absolute in agreement on that. Listen, we're going to go to a final break, and we will be right back. I made a discovery. The down-home community our grandparents loved is still here. Seriously, that's what you'll find at Renegade River in downtown Spring Lake. You might be looking for a new or used hunting rifle or something for personal defense. Maybe a DNR sport license or fishing supplies. Personal and home defense. Hunting, Army, Navy supplies. Fishing, survival gear, and even a tools and guy stuff consignment department. You'll be greeted by low prices and quick professional service provided by shopkeeper Mike Hewitt. If you're not in a hurry, grab a cup of coffee and join in the conversation. Renegade River, firearms, hunting, 
personal protection and survival gear. Going camping or looking for emergency products? Come take advantage of the prices while meeting up with old friends and making new ones. Renegade River, next to the police station in downtown Spring Lake. Or go to the website, renegaderiver.com. Hi, if you ever find yourself arrested in jail and got bail, make sure you call me, Tommy D, at Bad Boys Bail Bonds, 866-728-6400. Because if I can't get you out, you ain't getting out. Hey, have you ever thought about becoming a fugitive recovery agent and you're not certified, don't know where to turn, don't know what to do or what to expect? Log on to NationalAcademyOfBailEnforcement.com and apply today. Classes are forming soon in Michigan. Tell them Tommy D sent you. There is a new catheter that hurts less, and you can get a free sample by calling this number now. Pain and urinary tract infections have been avoided by many of my patients. The eyelets are polished, so they glide smoothly and effortlessly across your sensitive skin. Medicare and your insurance will pay for up to 200 of these catheters per month, all at little or no cost to you. Call now for your free sample. It will arrive with a complete 90-day order, and if it doesn't reduce your pain, we'll pick them up for free. Uh, welcome back, Michael. Uh, tell me something, just to get this segment kicked off, our final segment. Uh, how much do you love Obamacare? That's a joke, right? I love it. Just thought I'd oh, make sure you're well, paying attention, I, Michael. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't, I don't like it at all. To not to put too fine a point on it, I think it's a disaster, and if it isn't repealed, it's going to destroy the economy. I, I get laughed at when I say this, but you know, when you look at the Soviet Union, this is my another couple references I'll make to the Soviet Union in 1977. They re redid their constitution, and one of the things that they did is they enshrined uh, universal health care in their constitution in 1977, and some 14 years later, they financially imploded. And I think that, and by the way, when I was talking to the Russian lady, uh, she said the first notice that they had that there was an economic trouble was that nobody had insurance coverage all of a sudden. Uh, so it turned into a, it turned it's, it's not a it's not affordable. But it, it, tell me about your own state down there up here in Michigan. Our, our Republican-led state legislature and government in the last few months enacted uh, Obamacare's Michigan Medicaid expansion, which I always ref, affectionately refer to as the Medicaid explosion. Um, but but did you guys get down there and you're in Alabama? Did you get the uh, the Medicaid expansion or did you where are you at with Obamacare? On a state level, well, to be to be uh, to be uh, to give credit where credit's due, the state government here in Alabama has pretty much kicked and fought against that, uh, and and they've done as much I think as 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 has been possible legally so far to shield Alabamians from some of the worst of that. Uh, there have been uh, I've, I've noticed that there have been some Alabamians affected, but I don't think it's affected people in our state like it's affected people who. Have, who have kind of uh, grasped the whole enchilada, if you if you want to put it that way. So there has been some kicking and screaming and pushing against it down here. Well, up here in in Michigan, we have a, a Republican governor, a Republican-led Senate, and a Republican-led state house, and a third of our Republicans joined with the Democrats to a pa to pass Obamacare's uh, Medicaid expansion. Mm -hmm. and, and the unfortunate part about all of these things is is it's not even necessarily the health care that we could debate over, although I think it ought to be criminal to sell someone a policy with a four or $5,000 deductible. It, it, yeah. To me, that's insane. But yeah, I, will yeah. tell you, I will tell you that I think that the folks that are promoting it know it's insane, and the goal is to have it, and you've heard this before, I know, but the goal is to say, you're, you're right, it doesn't work. We need universal health care, health care for all. Yeah, uh, this is a Trojan horse. I yeah, think I don't absolutely. think it was ever meant to work. Oh, absolutely it was meant, agree. It, yeah, it was meant to fail so they could point to it and do just exactly what you said. That's what I believe. Now, listen, and that's not to say that the healthcare industry doesn't need a long look at, but I think it needs a long look at by the market and not by by the government. Yeah, and this what could it, be solved. Yeah. yeah, this could be solved by the free market much cheaply and much more quickly and without all the confusion. If you just let the market forces 
You, you know, people listen to my show before have heard all of this rhetoric from me, but it, it's it's the math. If you go into an overnight stay in a hospital in America, the overnight stay, the average cost of a single Motrin tablet is nine dollars, and the average yeah, cost of exactly. a single cotton ball is six bucks. Uh -huh. And so and so I say, wait a minute, why are we asking how to pay for the stuff rather than declaring we ain't going to pay for it? That's right. No, but when you go to the right. hospital. And they say, oh, Mike, you can't do that. The hospitals are losing money. And so I take a look and I say, well, what would happen if we just took off the top five layers of administration and just left doctors and nurses? <laughs> and the, the answer mm -hmm. is, is we wouldn't need $6 Motrin or cotton That's balls right. anymore. They'd be affordable. That's exactly right. Absolutely. So it's the same with the universities, college education. Oh, uh, my goodness. It, it's, it's, it, it's enjoyed an 800% increase since 1980. And while income since that same period has doubled. So you go, in, income has doubled, and, and higher education has went up 800%. And then now listen, the recent call I've been hearing is that I'm right. That's crazy. And that's why we need to make higher education public. And that's that's what the game plan was. was uh, yeah, that's going in exactly the wrong direction. Right. Now, the lady from the Soviet Union explained to me that in the Soviet Union, I think she told me it was three but when you were at a very young age, you were you were sent to a school that was controlled by the by the by the central government, and the rest of your schooling throughout was that was controlled by them, from three on. Well, when I look at our preschool program and all of the things that they're enacting, when you look at it with an open mind, you say, okay, yeah, we we need to get education going. The problem with it is is that the more of the stuff we embrace, actually, the less the the lesser education results we're getting. Uh, but the more indoctrination we're finding. Yeah, I was about to say, if you didn't, that it's not education, it's indoctrination. Now, and that, that's the whole purpose. You know, people people uh, say, oh, what a failure the American education, modern American educational system is. My contention is it's not a failure at all. It's doing exactly what they intend for it to do. Absolutely agreed. If, you know, you hear a lot about the Civil War, I bet, and... But if you go back to that era, uh, 18, uh, thereafter, 1870s, 1880s, look at your average reading, writing, and arithmetic book from eighth grade, which as far as people went, uh, the average college graduate would have a very difficult time doing any of the math out of that arithmetic book uh, uh, from, yeah. from eighth grade yeah. 130 years ago. Yeah, that's right, and the Latin and Greek, too. Oh, what? You mean <laughs> you mean they actually want them to learn a foreign language, whereas nowadays oh. if you pass French the French test on Friday, you're good to go. doesn't matter whether you know what you said. You just memorize these. Uh, and so you talk to a lot of people that graduated from high school with pretty darn good grades. Three years after they're out of school, they can hardly remember any of the foreign languages that they took because there's, yeah, there's, there's no association taught. It's all memorization for federal money. That's right. And unfortunately, English is becoming a foreign language to a lot of them. <laughs> yeah, absolutely it is. It's, uh, it, we, live in a, we live in a changing uh, country. When I'm writing, the, the book I'm writing right now, Michael, is called The Third Founding of America. And it's a sequel to the first. The first assumed that the country collapsed and was under, under, under the, the uh, auspice of a global socialist authority. And America, the citizens, beat back that. And that's that's how that novel essentially goes. Uh, the the one I'm writing now says, okay, we get to start with a clean slate. What are we going to do? And it's kind of funny because when you when you, I've I've often said this. If you listen to the quotes from our founding fathers, uh, the reason they're so apropos nowadays is they were fighting the same battle, but they won and we're losing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's true. You know that, that all all of the freedom, the things the things like your your call for secession. There's no founder that would have said, I'm going to sign up if they, if they didn't have the right to say, this isn't working, we want out. Yeah. Oh, no, absolutely not. They would never have done that. Now, in your organizations, by the, by the way, do you have any interaction with any of your, uh, your um, and I'm not looking for you to name names, but any of your federal representation, congressmen and senators, do you have any, inter any interaction with those folks? Are any of them uh, thinking maybe you're on the right path or declaring you as wrong, or where you're at with those with those folks? Uh, none of them are members. I will get that out of, the, out of the way up front. But do we have contact with them, fruitful contact with, with a few of them? Right. Yes. But we have even more fruitful contact, and some members 
in our various state legislators, legislators, legislatures rather, we have some state legislators who are not only members of the league but are friends of the league. Uh, but on the federal level, uh, no members but a few fruitful contacts. There are, um, as I understand it, um, there are other organizations that, in fact, I did some Googling again, looking uh, before before having you on the air. There are a handful of other organizations that are calling for secession also. I see one of them uh, still has a president uh, of a confederacy. They're, they're, they still have a, and I don't know if that's all internet, just a group of people on the internet, or if they're real. Is. is that is. is that what I'm looking at? Yeah, that's that's what I got. And some of those folks are 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 certainly have the flavor of being more radical than you. They're saying that they're living in an occupied South, et cetera. Now, where is your well, thought but, process on that? Yeah, I, look, I, I, these these are people who are largely on the internet. They want to, you know, they they give themselves titles. Uh, in fact, to be honest, I think I'm on their list of people to prosecute for treason. <laughs> Uh, no, literally, I, I, I got a message one time from their chief justice or something who appointed himself, apparently, and said, yep. uh, you're committing treason against the Confederate States of America. I said, okay, send somebody to get me. <laughs> you sound so, okay with that. I'm okay with that. Go ahead. <laughs> well, see, the thing is that we're not Confederates. We're not a Southern Heritage Organization. We are modern-day, present, and future-oriented Southern nationalists. We don't. We, we use the Confederate battle flag, but we use it largely to honor our ancestors and for symbolic uh, uh, occasions, things like that. We love it. You know, it's part of our heritage and history. But we have our own flags and emblems and songs and things that, for the modern era. Yeah, the, and, and the reason I wanted to get into that as we're slowly winding ourselves down is that there is a lot of confusion about what's real and who's radical and who's who's not, and how how nationalist is a person, et cetera. Um, and, and that goes to the, what we were talking about in the first segment about political correctness and how those those bumpers control the ball. Sure. Sure, yeah. We, uh, you know, we, we've been unapologetic Southern nationalists for 20 years. We told everybody who would listen that we have absolutely no uh, desire to, uh, you know, recreate the old Confederacy. That's gone and done with. Right. Uh, you know, we're, we're looking to the future, uh, present and future for the South, and for good government for the Southern people, and prosperity and freedom and all those good things that our ancestors uh, have fought for. Where, so, where, would, where would you folks be if you were able to have your own free, rep, free representation, uh, your own government? Where would you folks be on, a, uh, on, a, on the world stage in compared to how America acts on the world stage? Well, we certainly wouldn't have uh, bases. Uh, we, we wouldn't be an empire, let me put it that way. We wouldn't have bases in, what, 150 countries around the world. We would certainly uh, defend our borders, and we would defend our interests. Uh, we would try to be good friends with everybody, uh, other nations who wanted to be good friends and trading partners. We would try to stay out of entangling alliances like watching George Washington cautioned against. Uh, we try to be a good neighbor, a peaceful neighbor. Uh, we would uh, bring back our manufacturing base, uh, get rid of regulations, uh, have we, what we think would be a vibrant economy. And we've done studies. Uh, we would have the fourth largest economy in the world after the remainder of the U.S. and uh, China and uh, I forget who might who's third. We might be third. Probably Germany. Yeah, probably Germany. Yeah, but we would certainly be fourth. Right. Very, uh, very and that, that's a powerhouse. Tell tell me this, Michael. We've got two minutes left. Um, sure. If if a person was interested in learning more about your organization, uh, how would they find you? Who should they reach out to? Give us give us a little bit of information about that. Okay, Mike. Uh, we have a website. Uh, we're, we're revamping it right now. We're going to have a new one online pretty soon, I hope. But our current website is uh, www.dixienet, that's D-I-X-I-E-N-E-T, dot O-R-G, Dixienet dot O-R-G. Uh, we'll have, uh, within a month or so, one called leagueofthesouth.com. 
uh, which will be kind of a newer, more up-to-date website. We have a great Facebook presence. Just go on Facebook and look for League of the South. Uh, or you can uh, actually call us here at the office the old-fashioned way on the phone at 800-888-3163. That's 800-888-3163. I'll speak with you, uh, answer any questions you have, and send you some free information if you'd like. My, so. my, my last suggestion for you, speaking of competition, is that if the current billboard company you were doing business with doesn't want your sign and you said they control 90% of the market, that means there's 10% down there that might put your sign back up. Yeah, I've got, that, their, I've got their phone numbers right here. Yep, in front. I mean, I'm going to be calling them later that's, today. That's the beautiful thing about competition is it'll let folks make those kind of kind of activities. If you folks don't want our money, somebody else will. That's exactly right. Um, listen, now, I've, right. I, Michael, I've really enjoyed having you on the show today. And, well, Mike, uh, thank you. And we'll, I, I, I guarantee you we'll be talking again. Oh, absolutely! It's been a it's been a marvelous uh, hour here, and I really am much obliged to you for having me on. It's been a it's been a fun experience. Thank you very much, Michael Hill. You have a great day, and and folks, we'll see you next week. Thank you, Mike. to you by Renegade River. Hi, if you ever find yourself arrested in jail and got bail, make sure you call me, Tommy D, at Bad Boys Bail Bonds, 866-728-6400. Because if I can't get you out, you ain't getting out. Hey, have you ever thought about becoming a fugitive recovery agent and you're not certified, don't know where to turn, don't know what to do or what to expect? Log on to NationalAcademyOfBailEnforcement.com and apply today. Classes are forming soon in Michigan. Tell them Tommy D sent you. I've made a discovery. The down-home community our grandparents loved is still here. Seriously, that's what you'll find at Renegade River in downtown Spring Lake. You might be looking for a new or used hunting rifle or something for personal defense. Maybe a DNR sport license or fishing supplies. Personal and home defense. Hunting, Army, Navy supplies, fishing, survival gear, and even a tools and guy stuff consignment department. You'll be greeted by low prices and quick professional service provided by shopkeeper Mike Hewitt. If you're not in a hurry, grab a cup of coffee and join in the conversation. Renegade River, firearms, hunting, personal protection and survival gear, going camping, or looking for emergency products. Come take advantage of the prices while meeting up with old friends making new ones. Renegade River, next to the police station in downtown Spring Lake. Or go to the website, renegaderiver.com. I use catheters, and if you do too, please listen carefully to this life-changing breakthrough. There is a new catheter that hurts less, and you can get a free sample by calling this number now. Pain and urinary tract infections have been avoided by many of my patients. These new disposable catheters hurt less. It's an incredible new design that reduces pain. The eyelets are polished, so they glide smoothly and effortlessly across your sensitive skin. The old catheters would scrape and cut, causing pain and infections. These new catheters are totally different, 
so smooth and painless, they changed my life. Call now and get a free sample. Medicare and your insurance will pay for up to 200 of these catheters per month, all at little or no cost to you. Medical Direct Club handles all the paperwork with your doctor and includes lifetime free shipping when you call and join. Membership is free. Call now and get your free sample and painful cathing today.